Everywhere, people are paid differently for their work. What we are paid rewards skill, training and experience, as well as the types of work we do. But how big should those differences be between those at the top and the rest of us? And are very large pay gaps good for society and our economy? Let's focus on two people. Brenda is an experienced nurse in one of Britain's busiest hospitals. After several years moving up her pay scale, she earns £12 an hour, the average wage in the UK. Brian is the boss of one of Britain's biggest companies. He earns £1,200 an hour. That's a hundred times more than Brenda earns. In fact, that means Brian makes as much in just three days as Brenda earns in a whole year. Brenda struggles to get by on what she gets paid. Wages for average earners like Brenda have hardly changed in a decade. Whilst food prices are going up, gas and electricity bills are rising and rents are going through the roof. Brian, on the other hand, has seen his annual pay increase by two million pounds over the same decade. That means he now earns four times as much in one year as Brenda will in her entire life. Doesn't seem very fair, does it? The fact is, for the first time, most people in poverty in the UK are actually in work. Growing numbers of working people struggle to pay the bills and now resort to food banks just to survive. And as people on average incomes are increasingly squeezed, less money is spent in our high streets. The growing pay gap between pay at the top and pay for everyone else is bad for those who earn the least, bad for average workers like Brenda, and bad for Britain's economy. And all the while, people like Brian do better and better. But it doesn't have to be like this. Other modern successful European countries have prosperous societies with all the new technology and consumer goods that we enjoy in the UK. But in those countries, incomes are divided much more evenly. The super rich have a bit less than they do in the UK, but everyone else has a little more. If the total income of everyone in the UK was shared between the richest 1% and everyone else in the same way as it is in the Netherlands or Denmark, for example, 99% of us would be better off by nearly £3,000 a year per household. So, if we want to tackle poverty, we have to do something about inequality. Because higher incomes for some means lower incomes for others. Most people don't get their fair share because some are taking far more than their fair share. This is why it is essential for Britain to cut the growing pay gap between those at the very top and the rest of us. Learn more at highpaycenter.org and inequalitybriefing.org. Okay, so you need your identity booklets from page 47 and we're going to have a look at the differences in ethnicity and how that feeds into identity. So one of the main considerations when we're looking at ethnicity and the role that that plays in the formation of personal or social identities for individuals is that ethnicity comes from a whole host of different places and has different traits and characteristics. So it is something that you would self-consciously claim as part of your individual identity. So you may be white, you may be British, you may be Welsh, you may be English and so on. So depending on different situations and different levels and layerings of identity, um, your ethnicity comes from a whole host of different aspects and how they interact um, with various features of your life. So members of an ethnic group may well share biological traits, so things like skin colour, um, however, one of the more important things is that they share other cultural characteristics that can include religion, food, language, politics and so on. So therefore, what is meant by ethnicity is not a biological factor, but it is an experience that people um, live through and um, consciously claim as part of who they are. 
So, for example, if you look at the overarching ethnicity of Asian, um, this is often identified as an ethnic group in the UK, but actually those people who fall into the category of Asian don't necessarily share the same cultural characteristics and therefore they would not share the same ethnic identities. So research from Madhud points this out quite nicely. He talks about how Asians include a multiple different nationalities. So, for example, Pakistani, Bangladeshi, Indians, for example. Um, within that, um, those individuals can come from different religious groups, so Sikhs, Muslims, Hindus. And there may also be several language groups within that, um, Urdu, Bengali and so on. And further down, there can be different cultural traditions and things like that. So ethnic identity is tied very closely to national identity, which is your sort of more um, geographical um, location, um, the country from which you come. And ethnic identity comes from a whole host of different cultural concepts and cultural artefacts and traditions that form part of who you are. And all of those are things that you would self-consciously decide to embed into your own personal identity and social identity. So we're going to have a look at a video that gives us a little bit of an overview of what we mean by national identity. So my name is Jack Waters. I go by the name of J0117 from Bristol. I'm a grime artist. So since getting into this position of influence from social media and music, I've sort of tried looking at things that may not be talked about in modern day so much. For example, race, class, gentrification. And I've been hearing a lot of talk about white fragility, white privilege, white supremacy, and people's talking about whiteness as a whole. I've been seeing blog posts, Instagram challenges, Fiat 500, Twitter. So it's just got me a little bit curious, so I'm gonna go and find out a bit more about it. Hello, good to meet you. Hi Jay, it's really nice to meet you too. So my name is Leila Saad and I am a writer and a speaker and a teacher on issues of anti-racism and identity. And in the summer of 2018, I decided to run a 28 day challenge under the hashtag me and white supremacy. It was uh, using this process of reflective uh, journaling. And so what I was asking was a simple formula of a question. What have you learned about you and a particular aspect of white supremacy? And so we kicked off with day one, looking at white privilege. And it just was this incredible, it was like lighting a fire. It, it went viral. So what's your sort of definition of white supremacy? Yeah. So I think the first thing I think people need to understand is that white supremacy is not about per, it's not a personal thing if you are white or if you are given the privilege of being seen as white you um will be treated as if you are superior to those who are black and brown and indigenous which comes from you know colonialism which comes from the slave trade i know that the word white supremacy is often hard for many people to have to sort of look at. I'm not a white supremacist. That's those people who are, you know, the skinheads or the Nazis or the, the ones who, you know, use the racial slurs. But again, white supremacy is not something you can choose to opt in and opt out of because the whole foundation is set on this idea that white is superior. So Jay, I was really curious to hear about what it's been like for you especially as a white man in an industry that is, uh, you know, music scene that is very black. Yeah, and I feel I'm aware that with grind music and it being a voice of the unheard, I sort of see it as a voice of the streets. Of, I'm in a position now of influence. I need to be very conscious of sort of what I write about what I what I do, what I put on social media, I still pay homage and love to the history and of, of the music which I do, which I try to yeah. do as much as possible. It is an art form and it has to also relate to me and, 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 and be a part of me. Yeah, I think that 
that's the gray area that I think more of us, um, especially people who hold white privilege, need to be comfortable being in. It's not about you either are racist or not racist. You either are a good person or you're a bad person. You either are culturally appropriating or you're not culturally appropriating. And having more of the conversation of the complex layers of it, um, that we're all on this journey of, of trying to figure it out so that we can create a better world. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, listen to the first part. So this is my mate Ems and somebody I do music with. <laughs> so when I invited you down to have this conversation about whiteness, what did you initially think? Mm. It depends on how you talk about it, to be honest. Because a lot of conversations are just coming to dead ends. Well, we're this colour and we feel like this. And you're that colour and you feel like this. Like, I would say the dangers of having the, this conversation, when you will start to understand how disconnected you are, and if they even want to make the connection, because it will affect their lifestyle. Equality will take away from that, because they have more and we have less. So yeah, it's common knowledge that, that there's, there's a thing called Black Twitter, which is the black community on, on Twitter. Um, which is it, at times is very strong. You know, if 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 somebody slips up in the white community, it's cancel a clock. It is it's game over for them. Some might think, oh, well, can't we have a white Twitter? My short and brutal answer would be, you can't have a white Twitter because you have everything else. I feel like this is this could be an, an example of the disconnect, isn't it? If a, a white person may go on Twitter, they'll go onto Black Twitter and then they'll see some sort of joke about a Fiat, you know, the, Fiat, the whole Fiat 500 gang in it, like ditzy white girl stereotype in it kind of thing, like they drive a Fiat 500, watch Love Island 24 seven. Cheeky Nando's. Cheeky Nando's, partying, partying in photos and. Yeah. Cause that then begs the text. Um, it's the same thing, it's the same thing, the same thing as, yeah, it's the same thing as stereotyping me as being a, as, as being a gang member, innit? The difference between the stereotypes, like you can, you would stereotype a, a girl being Fiat 500 Twitter, but that's, that's a harmless stereotype. And it's stereotype me, black boy, gangster, and the gang does this, does that. There's, there's so much more, it's so much more harmful because these are things that are actually damaging the community and yeah. it can derail your whole life on the, in, on the other side of the spectrum, so. And it all stems from a place of negativity, really. Yeah, and ridiculous negativity because it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't, what's the difference? The difference between me and you is my hair's thicker, your eyes are lighter, you burn easier. Yeah. yeah. That's it. Appreciate that. Um, love always, man. My G. Yes. I will start. I think whiteness means the norm. Whiteness means majority. We really get educated on white people oppressing other races and white people having slaves and going over and not doing very positive things in history so that's why i feel like we do get told a history of whiteness but it's not one to be proud of or mm. shout from the rooftops mm. that's you know? really interesting actually because i i always assume that history is still not really accurate and even what we are taught is isn't what it is but yeah that's really interesting for you to say that i'm from america my mum came to England with no white privilege. She worked as a maid at, for rent. She works nine to five, six days a week, and she's done that for the past 12 years. White privilege doesn't necessarily have to be like financial. But, but at the same time, I think that sometimes it's hard for people to take that on board and to swallow that word privilege if they are somebody that grew up with nothing. Yeah. And I think maybe there are degree, I, I don't know whether you agree, there are degrees of white privilege. I think if it's Boris intersectional. Johnson more white privilege than I am. So it, de it depends on race, class, it depends on many things, but it is because a lot, it's a lot. Like, even for me as a black woman, of all of my life experience, and I've worked at a university developing a race equality initiative, I'm still confused and like, don't even know where to start. And like, with white British identity, um, I'll answer the question. I guess a lot of white people hold on to like the empire and you know the royals and I guess that's quite a big I don't know part of your identity or 
your culture. I would, I would, some, I, I some, think people. some people, yeah, but yeah. me personally, yeah. I, I, I wouldn't say that's part of my identity. But it's okay. always, yeah, and, and, and that's the interesting thing is that, that I would have spent a long time talking about diversity, mm-hmm. thinking about representation, and never, but never thought about, well, hang on a minute, I am actually white. What <laughs> yeah. does that mean? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's quite weird. It's really, very when you think weird. About it. yeah. Yeah. And with like this whole, like when you say you just never thought about being white, it's just crazy. Yeah. We have to think about being our skin colour every single day. Yeah, for sure. Just well, always. Yeah. Well, all to the an time. extent, like you, you say, like you say it like that, but like, so I lived in a cultured area. Like, I used to get stick for being the only yeah, white kiddie all, the, all mm. day long. And you have these conversations with people years after a situation happened, and you say, Why did you do that to me? And it's like, Because I, I wasn't mm-hmm. informed that, like, mm-hmm. I was informed wrong. Mm-hmm. And you, I can now go have a drink with these guys. Mm-hmm. Like, it's like, it's a very weird topic. It is. Well, I don't, I don't know, I mean, I know we're t- having the conversation about whiteness, but I don't really know what the outcome of, obviously it, it allows us to say, oh, well, I'm, I agree, and, or, or that. I, I suppose an, an awareness of white privilege, the system, institutions in which we operate, and then maybe not fall in for some of the manipulative messages which come from far-right groups. I can't be bothered to kind of always talk about, you know, oh, this happened today, someone touched my hair, because it's just what happens. But maybe one day we won't have to deal with it. Someone will come step in and say, hold on a minute, that's not right. I and feel, me personally, I probably subconsciously sort of just uh, try yeah, and, yeah, same, try and like... See, yeah. get... that can turn to that whole, I'm, I'm not proud to be white, to just... I, I, I don't even talk about it. Like, and that that kind of, oh, you know, I, I, I'm not racist, I, I don't know. That, that's not helpful. So, yeah. So it's, not about being, it's not about being right on, is it? Being no, right, being absolutely real, not. Real, yeah. It, Just yeah. listening or trying to understand or, yeah. 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 I think we got into it, didn't we? So we're going to have a quick look at nationality and the role that nationality plays in the formation of an individual's social identity and personal identity. So you've got evidence there from Anderson who talks about nation states as an imagined community. And this is really important when we're looking at nationality, um, because ultimately national identity and nationality can be considered to be socially constructed. So it's a creation from the media through education. Um, through the use of cultural artefacts and symbols such as flags, national anthems, sporting events like the World Cup, the Euros, the um, Olympics, and highlighting significant national people as if they are sort of part and parcel of this imagined community. So our monarchy, for example, Shakespeare, one of the greatest English writers, Charles Dickens, things like that, by putting these um, on a pedestal as if they're sort of symbolic of what it is to be English or British and so on. So national identity in that sense is a creation um, by society. Now, Miles talks about how um, throughout history this has um, caused a number of issues. So national groups or national communities and nationalities tend to encounter each other through trade and competition. Um, possibly war and sadly exploitation through things like slavery and one of the things that is evident from that is that we hold a distinction between ourself and the other people so one of the issues with national identity is that when you go through that process of um, social identity construction so if you think back to Taj and Turner and the ideas of social identity that once you are categorised as being of a particular nationality, so say you are English or you are British, um, you then take on board and identify with that identity. So you begin to adopt those nationalistic symbols, such as the flags, you know the national anthem, you support England by default in um, a football match, um, and you're experienced and exposed to media, education, uh, religion, and so on. This reinforces your identity, builds your self-esteem, so it connects your personal identity with your social identity. And then as a result of that, you compare yourself to other 
identities to other groups and that's where the negativity comes about so the consequence of that negativity and the representations of all other nationalities as being different strange inferior has therefore led to this sense that we are normal and they are abnormal um, and it is given rise to conflict to problems um, and to um, discrimination to the point of things like racism and war. So Billing takes this a little bit further and looks at that construction of national identity and how it's actually used by people in power, such as governments. So national identity is incredibly important when you are trying to rally um, your nation state to get behind the government in making particular decisions. So one really good example of this is all the propaganda that was produced and um, blasted all over the television and the media um, to encourage the Brexit vote. Um, so there was very much the selling of Britishness, what it was like to be independent, what it was like to be in control of our borders, what it was like to be English and self-sufficient and bringing back that sense of nationality that apparently we lost when we became a part of the EU. So that's a really good example of how this national identity is something that is constructed and picked up and reinforced, um, particularly when people will gain power, status and control. Um, it's also evident in cases of war. And very rarely are any wars about anything like national security. Um, it is usually all based on economic interest, power, control. So a strong sense of national identity is not something that we always have. But sometimes it is pushed and reinforced for the benefit of the ruling classes. OK, so if you can have a look at the information at the top of page 48, this um, gives you a little bit about socialisation into a national identity. So you've got primary socialisation, first of all, and the role of the family. You've then got your main agents of secondary socialisation, so education, peer groups and media and how that reinforces our nationalistic identities and encourages people to categorise themselves as a particular nationality and therefore begin to identify with that nationality and as such um, compare themselves to other nationalities. So pause the video, um, read through that information and then restart the video when you're done. So national identities are kind of underpinning ideas behind ethnicity ethnic identities, um, but there are obviously a wider range of different features and cultural aspects to ethnic identity. So when we look at primary socialisation into ethnic identity, which is the bottom of page 48, um, you've got some key bits of research. So as I go through it, you do need to read the little bits of more detail that are there in your booklet. Um, but you've basically got Elliot, who talks about how South Asian communities have adapted to a British environment and have kind of developed this cultural hybridity of their own cultural logic. So it is traditional Asian um, ethnic identity that is hybrid within British culture and British systems. So you've got that sort of merging of um, traditions, beliefs, values and so on. You've got Anwar who talks about how Asian families do still socialise their children into um, the traditionalist patterns of obligation, loyalty and religious commitments. Um, and in most cases, children do accept that primary socialisation. They take that on board as part of their own individual identities. This is reinforced by Butler's study, who looked at teenage Muslim girls in the East Midlands. And he looked at how their religious beliefs um, socialised through the family were taken on board, it was important to them and it is very much part of their individual identities, but equally they've adapted it slightly to fit into changing circumstances geographically um, and nationalistically living in East Midlands in the UK. German also looked at tradition, religion and family values and how they play an important part in the upbringing, particularly of second generation Asians in the UK. So it's maintaining that ethnic identity for the purpose of tradition of history of that rich cultural background that individuals come from but also making sure that that is within um, UK culture so again hybridity is coming into play and that intersectionality of lots of different aspects of ethnicity becoming part of an individual's personal identity.
So turning over onto page 49, we're looking at secondary socialisation through education. And again, we go back to Bordeaux, who talks about um, the dominant culture and how the dominant culture tends to penetrate in educational institutions um, within each nation that that educational institution is in. So he's looking at, in this case at the UK. Um, that dominant culture is reproduced in the minds, values and activities um, in wider society. So children from ethnic backgrounds may be at a disadvantage in the British education system. Um, particularly if you think about, you know, you guys have been through high school. So if you think about how you were taught British values throughout PSHE and citizenship, it is explicitly named as British values. Um, that is not culturally specific to all cultures that, you know, reside within Britain and within the UK. It is very much dominated by, you know, your white middle class um, Britishness, that historical monarchy, queen, justice, law and so on. Mason also points out um, that as a result of this, um, there's a possible sense of exclusion from the identity of British. So if Britishness is taught and it is very much reproduced through a school system, um, then it may actually result in people feeling that they can't or are not part of that particular identity and what it means to be British. So family becomes um, refuge from the problems of the wider community. So more emphasis then becomes placed on primary socialisation. Cord also looks at how the content of education completely ignores or generally ignores black individuals. So Cord um, talks about how this leads to low self-esteem amongst black pupils. They don't feel that they are part of um, the school community. Um, this can lead, again, when we look at subcultures, you can look at anti-school subcultures um, and how, you know, black, in, black pupils in particular do feel that the national curriculum um, is ethnocentric. So and it has been criticised as ethnocentric as well as androcentric because it tends to focus on men, because actually the national curriculum emphasises a very stereotypical white middle class culture at the expense of all other cultures. Very rarely through the national curriculum and normal day to day teaching do you cover aspects of black um, history, Asian history, traditions, the cultural features and aspects of all the different types of individuals that actually exist on the planet and within this country. Um, so much so that in actual fact um, across the UK and I think in America as well, um, but definitely in the UK, we have what we call Black History Month. Um, so the task that I want you to have a quick look at, should take a couple of minutes, um, is to find out what Black History Month actually is. You may well have done Black History Month um, throughout one of um, or two of your years in high school. But actually, I want you to pick this apart as a concept. Right. I want you to think about why on earth we have this in the UK. So why is it necessary to actually distinguish black history from white history? Right? Why is it that we teach this as if it is somehow something completely different to all of the history that we need to know about? Um, why is it that it is singled out and it is presented as other people's history? And this goes back to that idea of social identity theory. Right? You, this, this is taught as if it is somehow I don't know, different and, and, and not part of, of our history as white um, British middle class individuals. But it's something that you, you know, you should know about, but it's not really important enough to embed in our national curriculum. So I want you to have a look at that. I want you to find out what people's opinions are about having this sort of distinguished Black History Month. Um, and I want you to sit and form an opinion. Do you think it should remain as it stands? Do you think the curriculum should basically just teach for history on an equal level? Should it teach equally about all histories? And that's not just black history, but Asian history, Chinese history, Japanese history, Australian history. Do we need to understand global history as opposed to learning, you know, the dates that various monarchs came to power and, you know, how many of... Henry VIII's wives were headed and all the rest of that nonsense. So how do you think it should be approached? So 
You can buddy up with the person next year and have a chat about that. Um, make a note in the box on page 49. It should only take you a few minutes and once you've done, restart the lesson. Okay, so other um, secondary agents of socialisation include the media. So again, you've got research here from Gillespie. And he studied um, Sikhs who lived in Southall. Um, she, sorry. Um, shows how um, videos, so the Indian film industry of Bollywood, um, were enormously popular in that particular community. So that sort of use of the media had very important secondary socialisation functions. Um, it created that connection between specific Asian, Asian communities and the rest of the world. Um, it allows younger children um, to access Asian culture and language and reinforce that sense of Asian identity and sort of reduce and limit that sort of um, sense of feeling marginalised or excluded from um, wider film and movie culture. You've also got peer groups. Um, we'll look at this a little bit more when we look at youth subcultures, in particular youth subcultures that have risen out of ethnic identities um, but you've got young Afro-Caribbean um, individuals who often adopt identities that are based on shared identities with their peer groups. That quite often comes through youth subcultural activities, particularly music, hip-hop, hip um, grime, rap, all those different um, types of music that draw people together within that culture. Um, the shared experience of racism, unfortunately, and the sense of powerlessness also um, feeds into a black identity, um, often in a kind of negative manner, um, understandably, in the sense that, you know, the experiences of racism and feeling powerless and feeling unequal um, ultimately come through in those identities, those ethnic identities of um, particularly black young Afro-Caribbean males who are quite angry at exclusion and mistreatment across um, the UK in particular. Okay, so last up, but this lesson we're going to work through the information on page 50 um, and 51 where we're going to have a look at the cultural characteristics of minority ethnic groups so you've got research there from worth who actually gives you a definition of a minority group so that's any group of people who because of physical or cultural characteristics um are singled out from others within a society that they live in and that singling out results in differential and unequal treatment hence the term minority um so the term minority connotes dis connotates discrimination. Um, the two tend to go hand in hand. There are very, there are none that I can think of. There are no minority ethnic groups in particular who have power or dominance or equality in the um, country in which they are the minority individual. So in sociological terms, um, Minority group and subordinate group are used interchangeably um, and dominant group or majority group are used interchangeably. Right. So those kinds of definitions correlate with the concept that dominant groups hold the most power, the most control and subordinate groups are the ones that lack power um, and control in comparison to the dominant group. This will feed into your understanding of social inequality when we get to that topic. So it's worth making sure that you understand minority subordination and majority dominance. Um, minority is not necessarily about being a numerical minority group. Um, so, for example, a larger group can also be considered a minority group due to a lack of power. Um, this is quite evident in um, gender. Um, you know, the population demographic for men and women, I don't actually know what the current percentage split is, but it's at least equal um, and women are a minority group. You can also see um, that being the case in the apartheid system in South Africa, in which case the numerical minority were the black inhabitants of the country 
who were exploited, oppressed and dominated by the white minority who moved in there. So it's not all about numbers, right? It's about power, control and status, minority subordination and majority dominance. OK, so according to Wagley and Harris, um, a minority group is distinguished, between, is distinguished by five main key characteristics. So if you want to just pause the video for a second and jot down on page 50, the five characteristics that you can see on screen. Once you're done, restart the lesson. OK, so point one is unequal treatment and less power over their own lives. Number two, distinguishing physical or cultural traits like skin colour, language, religion and so on. Number three, involuntary membership in the group. So it might not be a group that you specifically identified with out of choice. It may be something that you are categorised in by default. Um, number four, awareness of subordination. So as a minority group, you would feel that oppression, that lack of power, the inequality that is sort of coming down on you from the dominant majority. Um, and you would have a high rate of in-group marriages. So um, very few um, sort of mixed um, ethnic marriages. Um, this also applies to things like uh, social class. So, you know, middle to working class marriages, not really um, a consideration, but actually the upper class elite very rarely um, marry out of status. Um, so you can see that in a number of different minority groups. Additional examples of minority groups, because it's not just about ethnicity, include the LGBT community, um, religious practitioners whose faith is not widely practiced in the area where they live, so Muslims, Sikhs, Hindus in the UK, for example, as it's traditionally a Christian country, people with disabilities, um, to a certain extent, women, um, and to a certain extent, young people, because they tend to have um, very little power in society, although as a minority group, they can actually mature out of that situation. So that's a slightly different um, context. Minority groups tend to be groups where you can't actually find a way out of it, so to speak. One of the main theories around um, the cultural characteristics of minority ethnic groups and how that actually influences somebody's identity is Dollard's um, theory. So his frustration aggression theory suggested that the dominant group will quite often displace unfocused aggression onto a subordinate group. And it's known as scapegoat theory. Um, it's about making somebody a scapegoat um, for frustrations. Throughout history, there are many, many, many examples of the process of scapegoating or the frustration aggression theory of how a dominant group has um, transferred anger or frustration or aggression onto a subordinate group who actually were not the cause of that frustration or aggression or did not actually deserve it. So um, an example from um, history that we are all aware of is Hitler and his ability to blame the Jewish population for Germany's social and economic problems. Um, and in the UK recently, this has been um, a very similar process where immigrants and refugees have quite often been the scapegoat for nation's woes. Um, so many, many states, not just the UK, have enacted laws to disenfranchise immigrants. Um, the laws are popular because they let the dominant group scapegoat that subordinate group. It allows people to look downwards, and we've mentioned this before, you look down to blame people for the problems in society instead of looking up to the top, to the leaders, to the politicians, to the people with power who are the ones that actually control um, the socio-economic climate in which you live. Um, no refugee on a dinghy coming over from France has control and power over the economic state of this country. But if you read the Daily Express and the Daily Mail, you would think that they are the people that cause every single problem that is going on in the world around us. So we're going to go back to the newspaper article that you researched about immigration and refugees. And I want you to focus on that, um, making notes about how that scapegoating is evident, making note of how that particular group is um, 
a subordinate minority group and who is the um, majority dominance, um, who benefits from scapegoating the individuals, so the migrant workers or refugees coming across the channel, and what kind of power and control do they get from that? Think about this as looking at the minority ethnic group of immigrants and refugees, but also think about it in terms of re-establishing that national identity as well that we talked about earlier on. So how does something like, um, you know, scapegoating ethnic minority migrants and um, refugees reinstill that categorization and comparison processing social identity how does it establish the other group for us to be critical towards and negative towards and build our own self-esteem so have a look at that if you want to find a different article um compared to the one that you found earlier on when we were looking at um this the first time around by all means find a different article it might be useful to actually print it off if you can um, so you can go back and see to this because we're also going to do a content analysis on this when you get to that point in your research methods. So if you do want to find a different article, by all means, you can do. If you want to find several, again, they might be quite helpful um, so that you can pick apart lots of different views on this. So your main scapegoating um, media would be the Daily Express and the Daily Mail. Once you've done that, make some notes on page 51. And then next lesson, we're going to have a look at Englishness and Britishness. So if you do have any questions or queries, please drop me an email or post a message up on Teams. Um, and make sure you've updated and included um, the activity on page 51 in your notes.